It's life. Life stay life. How have you been? I, I'm I'm appreciate I'm appreciating the YouTube resurgence, my friend. Thank you, man. I'm having a good time. I'm having a really good time. I, I mean, this is it's interesting because this is this is the most prolific I've been ever on YouTube. I've never dropped. I think you're right about that. Yeah, I've always been a weekly guy. You know, I tried to hold down Saturdays, right? But you well, know, now before we really get started, I want to thank you because I actually got some cool points with my kids because of you. <laughs> so, okay, like, what happened? I've been doing this podcast, so my kids are uh, nine and ten. Yeah, and I I've been doing this podcast since like around the time they can remember. You know, when my daughter was two, she made her first appearance on it. Yeah, uh, but. You know, they're at the age where they're getting really into like YouTube reaction videos and watching people play like Minecraft and Roblox and all that crap. Right. They make fun of me regularly because they think my channel is boring. Okay. <laughs> so the other day, um, because I noticed that you shouted me out in one of your videos, right. I was like, guys, guys, come over here. I was like, see him, see how many subscribers he's got. And I played the clip. Mm. And he's like, they're like, that's awesome. I was like, yeah, you don't get to talk shit about my channel anymore. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> like, I got friends in high places, you little motherfuckers. Right, right. Wait till they see uh, Jude's Patreon. Oh my god, absolutely. Yeah. I have you have you listened to his new show? I haven't heard any of it yet. I haven't heard it yet either, to be honest. I think he's taking a hiatus. Is he? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, a bunch of people in my, a bunch of the analysts in my audience have been asking me where he is. And so I reached out to mm -hmm. him. He said, you know, he said he's doing well. Uh, I think he's trying to maybe reformat some things. I'm not quite sure on all the details, but, uh, you know. Yeah, apparently yeah. It's, but it's the last time I talked to him was when we were talking about me doing like part time producing shit for it. And he didn't know what he wanted the show to be yet. And I wound up like getting a full time job and I wound up not having the time. But I like that he kind of has this. I don't know. I don't, I don't remember. I don't know if you remember the Farilli show from back in the day with him and uh, Sanaim Silla from uh, Binary Star. But that I don't was good. actually no, I missed it. It ran for a few years. It ended in like 2015 when he was doing his contract renegotiations. And it was just like Jude at his freest. And it, it wound up going about as well as it could possibly go. And it's, okay. if you go to the Rude Hub Patreon, which is like the third party yet Jude approved, like Jude Archive, all yeah. the episodes are there. Okay. And it's still to this day some of the funniest shit I ever heard. And it's, how I got in touch with people like Andrea Grano and how, and like Christian hand, both of whom have been on this show a bunch of times, like mm -hmm. to this day, I still owe so much to him. Right. Yeah. Me too, man. I mean, Jude held me down at a time when, you know, I really needed it. You know, I left the X and that's how the show, that's how me being on his show came about in the first place. It was sort of a partnership between nice. all out show and hip hop DX. And, you know, even after I left, he still, had me on and held me down. So, you know, that's my man, a hundred grand, you know what I mean? Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, the, the, the state of, you know, terrestrial and satellite radio is what it is. I get it. I'm sad about it. I wish they gave him the final year. Cause I really think he could have done some great shit if he hit 20 years and he was able to have that legacy, but he's going to land on his feet. He always does. Yeah. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Yeah. Um, yeah, so let, let's get right into it. Before I forget, I keep meaning, I've literally been meaning to ask you this question for seven years, and I always forget, and I have it written down this time. And it's a perfect time because you've rebranded your show from uh, TBD to It's All Happening. It's All Happening being a popular tagline from the movie Almost Famous, which is consistently in my top three movies of all time right which i think it is for you too it's up there it's, it's never it's never ever been below top, it's, it's never been below top five since i've seen it oh yeah 
All, my been. entire top five is was made between ninety six and two thousand two. Okay. For what that's what <laughs> it, it goes like, maybe not that close together. It goes like Friday, Clerks, Memento, Almost Famous, Death to Smoochie. I've never so seen that, Death to Smoochie. I've never seen the last one. Oh man, uh, dude, two thousand two. One of Robin Williams' best performances, he did it during his dark, kind of dramatic area. And it's it's oddly how I got into Edward Norton. And so, like, I got into him through a dark comedy, and the movie flopped. And so when people are like, "It can Edward Norton be funny? I'm like, mother... But uh, what's your relationship with Almost Famous and... You know, people who appeared in that movie like Lester Bangs, uh, whom you know you've subtly quoted in your show before. Right. I uh, I didn't see Almost Famous until had to be 2010, maybe. You know, maybe 2009. It was in that era before everything was streaming. Like it's before Netflix went streaming. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd already cut the cord, right? So I I cut my yeah. cable because you can still watch project free tv back then and any sh tv show you wanted to watch it was on friday it was on project free tv project free tv an hour after it aired right there so you go. I, and i was watching a lot of youtube then and i was still playing dvds so i cut cable i was watching project free tv and since i didn't have cable anymore my DVD budget went up. So I would go to Target and get, you know, whatever on sale DVD they had at Target or like, that's where I got Eastbound and Down, the, the series, which is Respect. Uh, the Boondock series I got there. Almost Famous is one of those movies I'd heard about because Bill Simmons, who's one of my favorite writers, especially at that time, he did a, he had the series where he would do articles that were just quotes. And they would take like quotes from movies and then he were related to basketball or something like that. And he did one that was just on all it's on on almost famous. I hadn't seen the movie. So around I'm guessing it's 2010, 2009, to, whatever. It was on DVD. I went yeah. and bought it and it hit me so hard because here's this music journalist trying to make a name for himself, following around his favorite band so he could write the ultimate Rolling Stones story. And so that was literally my dream at that point in time. Like, I just wanted to be the greatest rap writer of all time. You know what I mean? There you and, go. And I love that part with the with the Band-Aids. And they're walking around. They're saying, it's all happening. It's all happening. And they never really go farther than that with it. But it, I just identified with it so much. Right? Like, even watching that movie obviously spoke to me directly. Uh, I always felt like Jake Payne, who was editor of Hip Hop DX, editor-in-chief of DX, and now he... He's a producer on the Quest Love, Quest Love po uh, podcast and um, and Ambrosia for Heads, of course. I always felt like he was the William Miller of rap because, you know, he, he was so young, covering so many rap titans. And Lester Bangs, you know, honest and merciful. I, I always felt, I always appreciated commentary that was like that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so I just really identified with it. And so I just started saying it a lot. And, you know, Twitter was pretty new around that point in time. And so I would tweet it out and stuff and people would get this, you know, reaction. And I guess I never stopped doing it. You know, I, it became a tagline for video. I guess when I started my own channel, I think it's probably when I, I I'm pretty sure I must have said it in some DX videos at different points. Probably maybe on the radio. But that was more, I didn't have the answer to those questions on those, but it's just, now it's just a natural part of my lexicon. Now it's, now there's more meaning to it because the thing I like about that phrase is that whether it's good or bad, it's all happening. Like it's really connected to a, you know, be present mindset, you know, uh, a, you know, a type of mindset you see in books like The Secret, you know what I mean? Or um, just being aware of the energy you're putting out. But also for me, it resonates because whether I'm on path or off path, it's all happening, right? Um, and it is. And from a content standpoint, a branding standpoint, one of the reasons why I officially rebranded the show in that direction was because one, TBD was a bit innocuous. Two, the breakdown is so crowded now. 
you know, when when we started that show, there wasn't anybody doing breakdowns. So now everybody just does breakdowns. <laughs> There's a whole sector of YouTube that's just breakdowns. Um, and also, I felt like it was it was really tied to hip hop. It was tied to everything that I'd done in hip hop. Whereas now that it's branded, it's all happening. It gives me the opportunity to open it up. I've had an idea for a show that I've always wanted to do a pitch, like a full 30 minute hour long live experience that would be called It's All Happening. Um, so the commentary you see on YouTube is would be an A block. There would be a musical section. There's comedy section. There's recurring. like that's always been called It's All Happening. So this is really I haven't made the show, but this is really just a step in that direction. Uh, which is why, I mean, Mark Bastin did the rap on the, my intro. So thank you to him, <laughs> which is awesome. Cause like it's, that's even subliminal, right? It's like, just mm -hmm. is here, it's all happening. So right now mm -hmm. I'm putting it at the beginning and at the end and on every social clip. <laughs> so it's like, you know, it's reinforcing this thing, but it's really uh, an idea that I'm actual, I'm actualizing now. Right. And so I can go forward with this, with these other things. And I also wanted to, you know, just freshen up everything that I'm doing. You know, one of the things, reasons why I've had, you know, the hiatuses that I've had recently is because of either going through these different learning excursions, working at a record label, or working at television, or working in country music, or working in crypto, or working in tech, like just learning things so I can build my perspective. But also I've had a lot of loss, you know, I lost my grandmother, I lost my mom. You know, uh, you know, I've had my own mental health challenges and yeah. just in life in general, I've wanted to, I've just refreshed everything, you know, I've quit drinking, I quit, you know. Good to you, know, man. Yeah. So I'm like, so I'm super sober. Um, I picked up a hobby. Uh, chess is my hobby. Like I'm really into Wait. chess culture. Uh, I started volunteering. I volunteer every Saturday at the LA Mission. I've become an LA Mission ambassador this year. I've done some like 60 hours of volunteering, you know, which is not. I didn't realize I'd done that much until they awarded us this honor. And uh, so I've just really been focused on having a balanced life, a healthy life. And, you know, it's all happening. It is, in fact, all happening. Man, I'm, I'm sorry you went through all that. And um, I'm glad you're out the other side. It's, dude, I can fucking relate. The last couple of years have been, uh, it, it's a learning experience. I'll put it, posi put it positively that way. Yeah. But, you know, it, it's always good to see people, um, you know, persevere through that. Uh, I, I noticed that the a lot of the resurgence of your channel kind of came through this YouTube boom that came with the whole Kendrick versus Drake thing. And on top, like on top of like your resurgence, one of the most unexpected things to come out of that was the rise of Professor Sky. Right. Love him. Oh, he's great. He's great. I think I got off on the wrong foot with him. And I don't know. Because uh, it was before he like blew up, blew up and he like showed up in my feed. And it was like during the beginning of the beef. And, you know, I saw him and to be fair, I didn't mean this in any kind of a rude way. I, you know, I'd be a huge hypocrite if I do. I'm like white and nerdy as fuck. But I commented something along the lines of, like, look, the guy from the Juneteenth episode of Atlanta started a YouTube channel. I and think I saw that. I think I saw you say that. And he replied to me immediately. And my reply to that sounded like the weirdest backpedal ever, even though I didn't genuinely to this day claim I didn't mean it that way. Because if you watch that episode of Atlanta, that character has a lot of fucking nuances to it. Like, he means well, and even at the end of the episode, uh, you know, Donald Glover gets frustrated with him by, like, how many points he doesn't have against him. He's like, stop being so fucking likable. And so I've been trying to win my way back with him. But I do, I do really admire his work, and it was cool seeing your take on like the new Eminem single and his take on the new Eminem single, both being like on polar opposite sides of the spectrum, but also both argued very well. So it, he's, he's definitely somebody I admire. I yeah, just, I you mean, know, you know, his, uh, 
because we were talking we were talking before he did that video and um which is why he references me in the video you know because I, yeah. I that was an experiment for me i've never done a reaction video and i was like all right let's see what this reaction space is like i want to see what it's like over there and you know there's all kinds of technical difficulties you can't even really see me react the audio's off it's fine all right nothing starts yeah. off though but um you know i don't typically get into one of the reasons i don't do reaction stuff is because i that was my first time ever sitting through that song Right. Like I, you know, I, so in the way M raps, I was caught, I was caught in this space, right? I was caught in this space because the way M raps, you can't, I, at least I don't grab everything on first listen. Right. And usually by third listen is when I get it or second listen, you know, maybe depending on what the song is, but like, um, and I don't react to when I'm listening to a song, I don't listen. I, I generally don't experience, I, did, I generally try not to experience the song first with the video. I generally like to hear the song first because I'm not distracted by the visuals, right? And so there's all kinds of stuff in that reaction video that was terrible in my, like, you know, if I sat down and really thought it out, like the way I normally do when I talk about M or anybody else, my, my take would have been a lot different, but not different, it would have been more nuanced. But it really is dad rap. Like that's yeah. really what it oh, is. 100%. It's dad rap now, you know, and it is a weird palate cleanser. But but Sky hit me and he was like, you know, he he was on the fence at that point in time about even talking about it because he didn't want it to seem like it was a, you know, a content, like it was a, a views grab, like he was just doing it for the views. And I was like, do it, man. No, this is yeah, this is one of the biggest songs. I should definitely do it. And his commentary was so so deep, dope, and nuanced. I loved, and one, I didn't even know about the French school of, uh, of arguments or debating or whatever. Uh, hypothesis, antithesis, synthesis, or whatever. <laughs> whatever. That, that well, I mean, you, you argued at Oxford like an adult, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, very true. Um, and uh, so I, so that was great. And I, the things he pointed out too, right? It's like, we actually had a discussion about this. I'm still thinking about doing a traditional analysis analysis on that song i'll definitely do it when the album comes but i might drop something quick this week because one thing he pointed out that i really thought was interesting and he even left a comment on my video about this that the song is bad we don't need any more 40 year old white guys screaming about cancel culture right yeah and you know that is a very fair point and i was talking to him i was texting him i was like you know i think the reason why you know, this sort of Bill Maher rap perspective of Eminem didn't resonate with me as loudly is because in a sense to me, I feel like that's, he's always represented just the white male perspective on life, right? Ever since he showed up with, you know, an Oxycontin or Vicodin on his, on his CD cover, you know? Oh um, yeah, I forgot about and, that. And then, you know, ever since, essentially for me, Ever since he called X Clan racist, <laughs> I've just put him over there in the white guy box, and maybe not, like not even really realizing it. I'm like, oh, that's just the whitest thing I've ever heard in my life. I guess he is white. That's oh yeah, he really. This is who he is, right? And I, not and I never judged him on it. You know, I never, I never, I don't think I really processed it. You know, but looking back, I, that's where I always kind of put him, right? And so. Because he always, and everything that I see in broader, con definitely conservative media, but let's say 40-year-old white guy perspective, is, you know, this hearkening for the old days, right? And M always used to be the guy that would say stuff like, you find me offensive, I find you offensive for finding me offensive. You know what I mean? He's <laughs> the one that introduced all that to me in my life, you know? And that aspect of it is stuff that's always really been there. So I wasn't even really caught off guard by... <laughs> this Bill Maher, 40 year old white guy, you know, complaining about the old days perspective to me, he's always kind of just, that's just a yeah. white thing to do. <laughs> like in my opinion, not even just a white thing to do, but like, you know, because like, you know, I, I've got my older cousins and stuff who wish hip hop was like it was in the 80s and 90s, you know what I mean? But like, <laughs> it's, the same, it's the same thing. Yeah. And I think that's what a lot of us, like, especially people around our age who are getting on in years. And well, I'm getting on in years. I don't know. I feel like I am. But I, I think that's what we're 
starting to forget, maybe not us specifically, but like other people who, but like, I see a lot of people like railing on Gen Z, railing on Gen Alpha and the shit that comes out. And it's like, this is the exact same shit our parents were telling us 20 years ago. It and really how did we know? But there's, you know, a lot of my favorite app rappers have been taking this kind of perspective that I don't necessarily connect with, but I understand where they're coming from. You know, Glass Malone is one of my favorite artists. He made a, a really, really solid, you know, dope album called Cancel These Nuts last year. You know what I mean? And yeah, it's a funny know, so, title. so he's in that, you know, he has that perspective as well. You know, it, there does to a lot of people feel like there is a limit on what can be said right now. And overall, when it comes to cancel culture, one, I question it because who really gets canceled? You know, not, very few people actually get canceled. And the people mm-hmm. who do get canceled get canceled for cancelable reasons, in my opinion. You know, you get to that mm-hmm. Weinstein territory and stuff like that. Yeah, that's a problem. Um, you know, two, um, you know, Killer Mike, on I loved his album, Michael, but he's got this one song. He's like, don't come around me with that woke-ass shit. To me, that sounds like some broke ass shit. And I'm like, okay, Killer Mike. You know, you're, you're really going to go, go woke, yeah. go broke on us, Killer Mike. Come on, you're better <laughs> right. than that. I'm like I, 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 like, I guess. I don't even, you know, so, you know, we're, we are having more mature conversations in hip hop, you know, because hip hop is now at the point where it is mature. You know, it's, it's 50 years old. There's people mm-hmm. who've been a part of this who are older than 50 years old, you know, so. Um, I think like everything else is just kind of the conversation of growing with the times. Most definitely. Uh, and so one, the thing that I found the most interesting in your discussion with professor sky and, you know, your back and forth between videos was in when you guys were talking about the fallout for, of Drake's career. So like, what's he going to do going forward? And I, I think it was you who said, like, maybe he's going to go back to what made us like him in the first place, you know, being relatable, being self-aware. And it, it, it like hit me. Number one, like, shit, yeah, that's why we liked him in the first place. And, you know, two, nobody like you guys were the first people to even bring that up. And, and this was after like weeks and weeks after analyses. I'm actually like starting to put together my first ever video essay about it. And I've been, you know, going through old songs. I watched that uh, better than good enough documentary from 2010 and just watching the transformation of, you know, Drake, the Everyman to Drake, the whatever he is now. It, it's like it was such a slow burn that nobody noticed it was happening. Well, I think it's a sign of how long he's been here. You know, yeah. I mean, just the idea that Kendrick came out in 2009, mm-hmm. J. Cole came out in 2000. These guys have been around for a long time. We're not used to rappers staying on top for that long. I mean, it, a lot of rappers from the 90s almost seem like they took pride in retiring. These guys aren't even talking about that, you know, and I, I, I attribute that to Kanye West in a lot of ways. You know, Kanye, as soon as Kanye said, never leave while you're hot, that's how May screwed up. You know, I think a lot of people internalize that because Kanye hasn't gone away either. You know, he, like, he wasn't wrong. Right. Jay-Z was dropping every year. You know, he's probably the first one of that era to like before Lil Wayne, Jay dropping every year was one of the biggest things ever. <laughs> it's like mm-hmm. he, he kind of made himself. He he put himself in that spot because he never gave you a year without some new hope, you know. And, you know, I think with with Drake. I've. I've had some conversations with different analysts in my audience about how, when was that tipping point for Drake? Like, when did he start getting far away from who he was? I think it was after that Meek Mill battle. I think after he beat Meek Mill, he, his, his ego level went do, 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 do. And he almost got to a point where you couldn't tell him anything. Right. And not to say that he should listen to anybody. He's Drake. He's, world class he's in, you know immensely successful he's the first international artist ever to break hip hop in america you mm-hmm. know like he is a trailblazer by every sense of the word world every sense of the word excuse me but i think that 
let him feel like he was more culture than he really was, right? Because after that, you get a bunch of team up projects. After that is when he really starts jumping around every style every time it shows up. There's examples of it prior to that, but it it almost seemed like he was getting lost in his own sauce (laughs) after that. And uh, for me, just the quality of conversations that would come out of his projects, it became glaringly apparent how narrow they were. I think it was a combination of his winning the meat mill battle by a landslide when not a lot of people expected him to and his ego blowing up on top of him just kind of running out of things to talk about. Like, so like, I, I think we've talked about this before, like the narrative in a lot of rappers careers, like their first project is the come up, the life story. The second major project is the I'm famous. Now I'm adjusting the things. Here's how my life has changed since project number one. And then like, what was the one that came out after Take Care? Uh, Nothing was the same. Nothing was the same. That's his Mo Money, Mo Problems. It seemed like an extension of Take Care. There were some like undisputable highlights, like some classic tracks on there. But I also noticed he became less specific in his storytelling. And there, it was the first project where I was like, oh, this song's fucking filler. Okay, he's not really saying much on here. And by the time views came out and there was like, if you're reading this in between that, it was just like, oh, he's he's bored and he's just kind of going through the motions. And uh, no, here's another song about how hard he works and how the FBI is watching him. OK, cool. Whereas before that, we got tracks like You and the Six and Fear and uh, the the resistance and uh, look what you've done where he knew who he was. He knew who he wasn't. He was okay with that. And I think that's why a lot of people fucked with him because he like brought out this whole other moodier, more emotionally resonant side of that genre of music. And I think at some point he like, he for he also forgot why people fucked with him. Well, also the cosines. I mean, that is the yeah. other thing that I don't think people need to forget. It's 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 disingenuous to say that Drake made it without help, and he's only been giving people his stimulus package. That's so disingenuous. I mean, when Drake came out, I don't know how big this discussion was, but I know that all of us in Brooklyn and our scene, and all the journalists I was around, and all the artists I was around. We used to talk about, we used to talk all the time about whether or not Drake should have signed the cash money at all or anybody. Here is a guy with, here's Canadian Zach Morris, and he is a dope ass rapper. And this is an independent era, and the entire music industry is cratered at that point, and streaming is, isn't even a thing yet. Nope, no, and it's direct, a current season. Direct sales is working great for a lot of people. Bandcamp is functioning, it's out there. You start seeing independent success stories around. Why even sign? Yeah, you sign because you need a co-sign. You need to be under the umbrella. You need to get your cool points up. You need to build re- relationships. That's why people do certain things. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And so that is how we even got a chance to hear him on a broad scale because we heard him next to Wayne. We heard him next to Ross. We heard him next to Hope. We heard him next to M. We heard him next to Kanye. That was critical in getting us cool with that sound. That was huge. You know, like whether or not if there's a thing in the music industry, it's called the fuck you deal, right? Everybody needs to take a fuck you deal to get to the next checkpoint, right? Because you need someone out there advocating for you. You need someone who's opening doors for you. You need these things. That's why you can Mm -hmm. have someone who has as big of an audience as Tom McDonald, but Tom McDonald ain't going to chart. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, you just you just need stuff like that. You can be you can be nav all day, but that doesn't mean that you're going to be cool. <laughs> doesn't mean that culture is going to rock with you. No disrespect to any of these guys, by the way. I mean, all disrespect to Tom McDonald, but no disrespect. Yeah, fuck that dude. Right now. <laughs> but like, you know, it's just like Eminem and Dre, right? M needed Dre in a major way. <laughs> like that. Like if you put M anywhere else. 
he'll be a dope rapper. He's not going to be superstar out of here because he's not going to have that same connection. And, you know, I think M would have done way better than Drake, you know, on his own independently, simply because Eminem is American. <laughs> That's mm. a huge thing. I mean, just that is a plus. There's no international rappers who, I mean, what do you got? You got 21 Savage, fucking Slick Rick. I guess. We didn't know 21 was British until he got deported. <laughs> right, exactly. So it's a very difficult thing. <clears throat> There's a lot of fantastic MCs all across the world, but breaking this market is, this is, even non-rap, this is a, a, a difficult market to break. You know, when the Beatles mm -hmm. got here, that was a big deal. You know, they when the Beatles broke America, that was huge. <laughs> I don't think, I don't know if there had been another band from UK that had broken America in that same regard. I could be wrong. I'm not a historian of rock and <laughs> But oh, yeah. so you know, Ed Sullivan. he brought I'm not saying that Drake did everything. He, he, I'm not saying he wouldn't have been anything by himself, but those cosigns catapulted him, which is why everyone got together and pulled that culture card. That is what happened. Right. Because the same thing happened with Eminem and D12. Right. Even behind the scenes, there was a lot of at different points in time, you know, how about this? I assume, you know, <laughs> allegedly, whatever terms, but at different points in time, you know, you know, those guys are, you know, felt like they should, they, they had to have discussions about getting paid more at different points in time. When Eminem stopped doing D12 albums, you know, that affected everybody's money, right? And everyone's like, mm -hmm. oh, Eminem just built those guys up. No, being around those guys, they're, they're, his entire come up in life helped him tremendously. Everybody saw 8 Mile. He needed, he needed, what's the guy's name? Uh, Furious? Future? What was his name? Oh, uh, Proof. No, right, I know Proof. Oh, oh the guy <laughs> Proof is based on Mackay Pfeiffer. For all yeah, Mackay Pfeiffer. Like, that was his, you know, his, yo, guys, he's with me. He's cool. Like, people need that. You know, there's a, a YouTube channel called What the Dirt. They really pretty much talk about rap beef all the time, and they break it down fantastically. Dude breaks it down. Oh, he's great. He did one on Kid Rock. He had the dude that Kid Rock leached off of to get accepted in his video. Like you need that kind of stuff if you're from outside of, of, of a culture, you know, or if you need that kind of stuff to, you need a fuck you deal to get into certain industries, certain spaces, you know, or, you know, I could have been doing YouTube videos on my own, I guess, but I needed to be at DX to even get the, you know, immediate opportunity to share my ideas with a big audience fast. You know, these aren't, Things that are a knock, these are things that are just part of how things go. And so whatever happened at some point in time, <laughs> everyone looked up and said, okay, this dude's been around too long, man. Look, he did that to you? He did that to you too? Wait, you too? You, I mean, we've been had 20, uh, XXX and all these young people talk about, I, I think maybe that's when it changed. Like the young people, the younger artists were the ones that were like, ah, I actually don't want to work with Drake. You know, I know he's going to take my song and I'll never blow up. <laughs> you know what I mean? So oh, yeah, the the weekend tried to warn everybody. Tried to warn everybody. Yeah, and I think yeah. the difference nothing was the same was like uh, the weekend's albums, like half of his songs were on there. I think that was take care. I think by it nothing was the same. They no, not like nothing was the same. I'm sorry. Yeah, take care. Exactly. My bad. No, no, you're right. It was, just, it was uh take care, right? That was like a weekend album. It sounds yeah. exactly like the weekend. <laughs> Is yeah, that and, and that whole so did did Drake actually bring that sound in? I don't know that that's the sound that I equate most to being a Canada sound. It sounds cold. It sounds northern. You know. Yeah, yeah. You know, the the quintessential example of them both doing that is that song, uh, "The Zone" off of the Weekends mixtape. Right. Where it's shit. I used to go running to that like in the fucking cold back in 2011 or whatever. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. yeah and i'm not saying he needed to like stick to that sound i think the difference between what drake and kid rock did and what m did is that m kept the cosign in his story the entire time like to this sale he'll come out and say like no i needed proof to you know cosign me at the hip-hop shop or whereas yeah. Gradually, like Drake kind of started to pretend like Wayne wasn't a person in his life. And maybe that's because he wasn't. And Kid Rock went the whole they took our gerbs type of route. And uh, 
Yeah, like I think a cosine is okay, but it's just what you do after the fact that makes all the difference. And I think Drake is experiencing that now. Right. Yeah, we'll see what happens. But you know, I agree. I, I think I think him being a person is the best way to go because I it's odd to me that I've been listening to him for as long as I have and I don't know anything about Canada. I don't really know that much about him. You know, I got he and I don't necessarily blame him for this. You know, th- we've been in a lot of the most popular rap over the past 10 years has been Snapchat rap, you know, mm-hmm. been, like Insta caption rap. You know, you say like a fly couplet and you move mm-hmm. on. You say a fly couplet and you move on. You know, there hasn't been an emphasis on storytelling. Definitely hasn't been an emphasis on third person storytelling, you know. So, and Drake has done plenty of interviews talking about he can only rap about his own life. He can't rap about other stuff. And so, you know, that's when I started looking at him as a very narrow MC. And if all he's experiencing now is essentially hedonism. Yeah. You know, and, you know, to both of our points, when he ran out of life stories to tell, he just kind of ran out of shit to talk about in the first place. You know, I look at Kanye West as someone. See, the difference between Drake and Kanye, because people would say Kanye ran out of things to talk about, too. Right. And Kanye has all kinds of ghostwriters. He never hides that. And Kanye, you know, collaborates with all kinds of people. And, you know, he does a lot of stuff for shock value. But Kanye is inherently, he is part of foundational Black American culture, American Black music culture. He's one of the most influential Black people to ever walk this earth from America, right? And he inherently can make certain types of songs that you know, Drake just can't make, you know, like Drake can't make a gospel song, (laughs) you know, Drake, I guess he could try, but you know, I don't think it would come off as authentic. Like Drake can't make a song like, you know, um, uh, what's the song on Donda that I love? Oh my God. Just the Jesus song. Oh, uh, tell me if you know uh... someone that needs Jesus. Yeah, and, uh, the, and, the one with Larry Hoover Jr. on it. Yeah. Uh, Jesus yeah. Lord. Jesus Lord, right? That song has Styles P, Drug Dealer. That song has J Electronic of Muslim and Kanye. And it's essentially an altar call. Like, it's a black church experience. Like, you go to a black church, there's like, you know, I don't know if, you ever, I don't know if you've ever been to a black church or not, but there's always a part in black church where they have the altar call, right? And that's where they invite other people to join the church to sell their story. And usually there's a song that, like a little short short hand clap or a little harmony that the whole congregation sings, and then the person gets up and tells their story. That song is an altar call song, you know what I mean? Like that is a, that is a deeply rooted cultural experience, right? And those kind of things are always mm-hmm. on projects. I- you know, I'm not particularly religious now. I grew up, so I, I grew up in Oak Park, Illinois, which is on the border of, like, the part of Oak Park I grew up in is, like, on the border of that town and the west side of Chicago. Mm-hmm. I went to, like, Longfellow Elementary. There's a bunch of kids from the west side who would, like, get bussed in. And so it was, like, an incredibly diverse, eye-opening experience. And... Um, this is this is my most memorable black church story. So uh, I knew this kid in high school. His name was Marcus. He was a basketball player. He had a heart attack and died in the middle of a game. Oh wow! And this was like late two thousand two. Uh, and so when I went to the memorial service, which was at this like little church on, I believe it was Madison Street. It was the same week that uh, Jam Master Jay had gotten gunned down. Wow. And, you know, the, you, know you come in, uh, the service hasn't started, the gospel choir's already going, they're already performing for the people just like walking in. That was the first difference for me. And the pastor, who was like making jokes in the middle of the service and kind of bringing comfort to his family in that way, like that, that was, you know, point number two for me. It's like, oh, wait, they know how to do this better. Because I, I went to the white church that my parents dragged me to um, that, you know, not nearly, not nearly as engaging. 
And yeah, then the right, pastor right. said something I will never forget. He was like, this was a very hard week for the black community. First, we lost Marcus. Then we lost Jam Master Jay. And I like chuckled because I thought he was joking. Mm-hmm. Like, just like, you know, on some dark humor shit. I'm like, and I look around, I'm like, oh, wait, they're serious. Yeah, right. I mean, but yeah, no, it, in my limited experience being in that environment, the one thing I was able to take away was they weren't afraid as of grief as we were mm. and everything that comes with it. The sadness and the part where you're trying to diffuse shit with humor and, you know, people were able to cry in the pews without being like politely escorted to another room. I, it, it, it changed my idea of what I thought, you know, spirituality could be. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just another thing that's part of, everyone has stuff that's part of their culture, you know, and that's, that's like another element that it's difficult to, you can't replicate if you're separate from it. I mean, that's what I like about this battle so much. That's what is compelling, right? You know, everything that I've done in my profession has been life through the lens of hip hop right that's that is it's literally on my on every any social anything it's on the banner of my youtube channel like that's the mm-hmm. angle that i i appreciate the most just life through the lens of hip hop and everything is very culturally rooted you know like i did an eminem piece it, can eminem be the goat like can a, can a white rapper be the goat like can it even be a thing was the question yeah. like eminem seems to know that eminem always pulled that punch <laughs> Eminem has a very difficult time going outside, outside and saying he's the greatest rapper of all time. And until, until recently, he's been more comfortable with it. But for a long time, a lot of rappers who achieved a lot less <laughs> were saying it way more <laughs> because you know, dude, there is an understanding that comes with that. He holds back to this day like that song he did with Kid Cudi a few years ago where he's like, King of Rap, nah, their words, not mine. Right, exactly. You know, and but that's to me, I take that as a sign of respect, right? Because the other side of it is you come in, you start acting like Drake, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you start acting like you put everybody on, and oh, because you've got Canada with you, that it makes a difference. I mean, there's there's so many rappers who don't sell records that are hyper revered, like you know, the the industry side of it isn't solely how this you know, how this culture bases its, 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 its godliness, you know, that's almost like an added thing. Like, yeah, Jay-Z is fire. He might be the greatest ever, even if he sold wood, but the fact that he's one of the best selling ever adds on to it, you know, like Biggie's one of the yeah. best ever. And if he didn't sell no records, people would be like, yo, but that Biggie dude is crazy. Mark but Homme doesn't sell point, records like these dudes, but Mark Homme is, he's <laughs> revered by everybody. But to that point, Jay even admitted he had to dumb himself down just to sell records. So he kind of yeah. let you know where his priorities were right away. But either way, he's excelled at both. You know, that's yeah. what I mean. Like, you know, it's it's an added thing. It's not the only thing. You know? like, oh, yeah. He is capable of so much more than his usual out. But I thought some of his best work in the last 10 years was uncredited on that Jay Electronica album. That album is so funny because that that to me is a representative of, of how cultural Jay-Z is, right? Because that album, I love it, by the way. I'm not gonna diss the album. I like the album a lot. Oh no, I I yeah, it's it's not act two, but like it's not nothing. But <laughs> Jay-Z, that the year before that was a crazy year for Hove, right? Because Hove, he went out there, made that deal with the NFL, and told everybody we're past kneeling. We're past kneeling now, right? <laughs> and everybody got so mad at him. They're like, see, ho, this is what we're saying. You sell us out every chance you get. That's the cultural feeling. That's the cultural conversation that was happening. One, he was also extremely correct because George Floyd passed away. He, George Floyd was murdered not long after that. And there was a whole lot of kneeling going on. So he treat that like death of autotune. Two times Jay-Z was really incorrect. <laughs> but like... um. But what do black men do? What do black men do, black people do when they get in trouble? They run to Islam. 
So he went and got Jay Electronica off the couch and said, hey, Jay, Jay Le, we got to put an album out right now. You know what I mean? <laughs> that is just, that is a black community thing. It's a black culture thing. Black men go to jail, they come out Muslim. Philadelphia mm -hmm. is a Muslim city. We're very spiritual people, including Islam. We love Islam so much, we created two Islams on our own. Right? We created the Nation of Islam, that's created by Foundation of Black Americans, and we created Five Percenters. <laughs> like, that's, like, so when we get in trouble or when <laughs> we need community, if somebody goes and runs to Farrakhan to go have a talk, or we go, you know, in this case, Jay-Z was like, all right, man, let's go, jay -Lex. let's go. Come let's on. Get, I need to get the culture back real fast. I need, to let I need my advance right back, in. Jay. You know, so I, I'm maybe I'm cynical in how I, dis I discuss it and describe it. But these are examples of things that resonate culturally. And that's why I find this battle with Drake so compelling, because even within it, he made so many subtle reminders on his own unforced errors that speak loudly to the people who have where he's made his money mm -hmm. about how much he is not like us, <laughs> right? Like when like the dude disses his own, he disrespects his mom on family matters. Yeah. That is a white thing to do. Like I grew up around white people, right? Like we, I grew up in white neighborhoods with the white schools. And I remember when I was, I had to be like five years old, six years old. And one of the kids up the street from me, his name was Paul, Paul Bonwich. And he was, he was one of my closest friends at that time. We used to ride bikes together in the cul-de-sac, right? There you go. And then his, this, shit, this would happen on a regular basis. <laughs> like we, We'd be riding around after school in the afternoon. And his mom would come outside and be like, Paul, time to come inside for dinner. And Paul would be like, I hate you, mom. I hate you, mom. <laughs> and I'm like, and I would look at him shocked. I'm like, it's okay, Paul. Dinner tastes good. You should, you should go eat some dinner. It's fine. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because there wasn't no I hate you moms going on around in my family, you know, my extended family when I went to my mother. That was not a thing that we, that's just not, doesn't, it's not tolerated in our household. Yeah, I don't think Drake was expecting to be proving Kendrick right with that that beginning of the song. No, and the number of times I've had people describe how that slaves line, even people who are super Drake fans, they're like, "Yeah, that slaves line ran me the wrong way, ran me the wrong way." Yeah, and still killed him though. I mean, these are very subtle things, right? And that's that's the difference between you know an Eminem, a Nav, a uh, Tom McDonald, a Drake, a Post Malone, all these people. Right. All these fantastic artists, you know, and they're all talented in their own way, hardworking, successful cats. It's like they're doing something. They're successful in a venue, in a lane that was created by a particular population and is the youngest one. Right. You could do the same thing with rock and roll at a period of time. You could do the same thing with jazz at a period of time, blues at a period of time, country at a period of time. And so you, we can always tell and listen to see who is where and what in the, in the small things. So a song like Not Like Us gets really fucking loud. <laughs> and, and it connects to where any culture can use that song, right? I mean, any, any culture can say, oh, they're not like us. If, so it translates well. I've been watching people at bar mitzvahs and quinceaneras playing that song. You know, it's it's pride in your own community while being it's a different. So it's amazing. Yeah. It is fire. It is like it is one big ball. I was talking to Glasses Malone the other day. He's like, Drake should have never taken the battle because Kendrick is just one big ball of culture. He's just all he is is that, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's uh you no, know, it is definitely a lot there, and it kind of goes to you. The point that you made like several videos ago comparing like current period Drake to like fat on the toilet Elvis. Where it's just like we know what happened to Elvis at this stage in his life. What's going to happen to him? I hope not. You know, I, I don't wish anything ill on the kid. No. But like, look, I mean, the dude's getting plastic surgery. You know, and that surgery didn't go well. He had complications. He had real complications from that, you know. The, yeah, I didn't mean, he, like, cancel a tour because he was, or, like, a bunch of tour dates? Yeah, and he, he, he I'm pretty sure, I just know he had real complications, right? And I don't, but, know how, I don't know how detailed he's ever been about it, but I know it's a real thing. And 
you know, and, and he's just really pompous. You know, the number of times he makes it seem like, I mean, one of the lines in he says in, in push-ups, which I think is either his best or second best song in this battle, because I love Taylor Made Freestyle. <laughs> is, um, he said, cornball, your show money, merch money, feed us. That is such an Elvis thing to say. You yeah. know, it's like, you know, on on uh I on the hard part six, he's got the I am a general honors and decorations. Uh, coming from him at that point in the battle, that sounds like a colonizer thing to say. Yeah, <laughs> you know I mean? he didn't think that one through. <laughs> well, none of these things, because this is his first time where he's been in conflict with the culture, right? He has been in conflict with the industry multiple times and people in the industry for so many times, right? I mean, he got in a fight with Diddy. Diddy smacked him. He had Suge Knight call him out. You know, he's had Kanye, go, all these different people, the industry side of things. He's experienced that on every level. But this is the first time he's been in, in opposition to culture or in a position to where he could come across his opposition to culture. Or be it like, and he, every chance he got, he just, and that's what resonates the loudest to me. I know I keep coming back to it, but this is a phenomenal anthropological moment in music, right? Like at every moment, this is the guy who's been at the top, who's been making so many great songs, who, uh, you know, whose music has been embraced by people you wouldn't even think would rock with it. You know, this cold, airy, you know, emotional, emo music from a guy who's half singing all the time. You know, you couldn't mm -hmm. put that in the 90s. They PM'd on his ass off stage, but it's been embraced by so many people because he's so good at it. And I think that he never really understood how far away he really was until, I don't think people even thought about him not being, you know, part of culture outside of people who are, you know, followers and critical of, the music and the media they consume, I don't think the general person had any of these thoughts cross their mind. And every step of the way in this thing, you really get to see how far away from culture, this particular culture, foundation of Black American culture, Drake really was. And that's separate from how he would leverage other people's sounds to be more successful. That's separate from allegations of an OVO sweatshop. That's separate from his his yeah. tendency to go around and say that he's the reason why other people are making money it's separate from that like just just small nuanced things sitting in your face at a critical time to really express and share who you are and he is using slaves he is making military references he is disrespecting his mom <laughs> like, like all these things are loudly proving Kendrick's point it's just it's just fascinating this and in my you know couple of decades plus following this genre this is the first time i have seen people go back and appraise and reappraise an entire catalog knowing what we know now like it, it it's like when people are going back and watching the cosby show mm. you know post 2015 it's like like not to that level of severity but let's hope not yeah, but like you're you're looking for the breadcrumbs of like where it went wrong. Was this who he always was? Well, I mean, even with the Cosby show, we know that Bill Cosby made that stuff. Yeah. You know, I mean, the only problem that Drake has on that front is he's been talking about how he's the greatest. You can't mm -hmm. leverage. Kanye doesn't even talk about how he's the greatest rapper MC. No, you know, Kanye talks about I mean, Kanye is the greatest artist to me. Uh, I think. If, I, I can't think of any artist in music who is better, greater than, than Kanye and almost in culture in our generation, you know, I, I just don't, I, I guess there might be other people that are debatable, but Kanye went to at least two different industries and revolutionized them. So I don't know about that, but he's not walking around talking about how he's the greatest rapper every day. No, he just makes everybody else sound better. You know, no. that's, that's he, like the difference. He deliberately uses the word artist over rapper. Yeah. I mean, there was a point in time where he wanted to, he said, I'm a top five rapper. I think right after Ham dropped, he did an interview where he said that, right? That was the time mm. when he would, he would stop smiling real quick in his interviews. And, you know, maybe he was. I think there was a period of time where you can argue he was a top five rapper. You know, those early Kanye albums it had so much imagination. Like that song, Gone, Gone to me yeah. is one of the most phenomenal 
it's one of my favorite raps of all time. And the story, the way he plays it, you know, the the literary devices, the opening the store, get a job for me. Sorry, Kanye West is gone. Having Cameron on there, Cameron and Dipset had just dissed him because his pants were too tight. He's got him on the track now saying, y'all want no problem mm-hmm. with me. What you rappers could get is a job for me. Like that is some straight hip hop shit, 100 percent. And I love that rhyme. It's so good. But oh, yeah, that, that, that last verse he does at the end is fucking phenomenal phenomenal you know you can make an argument at that point in time he was top five but he's not even going around saying that because he understands the difference like i the mob ties reference track leaked and that's a big reference track to leak because that is a diss track that's a kanye west diss track and yeah. now he's not even right <laughs> his kanye west diss, his diss tracks are ghost written Oh, oh my boy. God! Yeah, you're right. Now people are reappraising. You have to reappraise this catalog now, yeah, because of how he's been talking. You know, you don't have to. Easy E doesn't sit here and talk about writing all his stuff. Diddy didn't talk about. It. Don't worry if I write rhymes. I write checks. I write checks. You know, and maybe there's too many parallels with Diddy and Drake at this point in time because you know, they they both make a lot of enemies. Oh dear God! Yeah, I mean, whew. yeah, I'm I'm sure Diddy's had his last steps in america as far as we're concerned if he can leave yeah isn't he in like dubai or wherever he made that apology video no he was in miami oh shit okay he might just be getting way too cocky about it but uh i mean they could have taken his passport you never know that could have been that could have been the, the feds obviously know where he lives i allude i just i you know i i make that sad joke in my diddy coverage but I'm disgusted by that, a hundred percent. You know. Yeah, no that that one hurt my heart. Speaking of reappraising art, my one of my favorite comedies of all time was Get Him to the Greek. Mm-hmm. And so, like, tell me if you can think of a more poorly aged cast list: Russell Brand, Diddy, and Jonah Hill. Yeah, I like Jonah Hill still. I don't know what he, oh, bad yeah. news he might have, but he's. I mean, he's the least severe where he turned out to be like a prick to his ex but he's not like committing crimes like the other two are right right i didn't even like that movie when it came out to be honest i didn't think it was funny i like and i like those john apatow like comedies but that one didn't get me but i what i i watched it for diddy's performance because like he is he like out comedy the two comedians like he is objectively undeniably hilarious in that movie and he's just playing what we assumed at the time was an exaggerated version of himself but maybe that's not true yeah i think i think that was him being himself very accurately (laughs) because i saw making the band you know (laughs) yeah maybe he's just method acting we should i don't even think it's method i think he just said oh i just gotta be myself yeah i can do that (laughs) (laughs) What was right, the name that. of the dude from uh, making the band that wound up sticking around Bad Boy? Uh, Ness. Ness, yeah. Do you do you know Ness wanted eight hundred dollars for me to interview him? Just gonna call that out right away. How recently? About a year ago. Oh no! It was before the Diddy allegations. Well, no, when you get, I mean, you know, a lot of these artists. I want. Mean, I respect it, right? I respect it. You know, I, artists. Like, I'll pay for people's time, but right. $800 for Ness. Yeah, $800 is... Let's, if you do, do the math on it, right? So you get a $1,000 for every million. So you'd have to have a million view conversation on YouTube with Ness. See, oh, yeah, my yeah. channel's not even monetized. I don't upload often enough for that. See? What's he even thinking about? You know? Yeah, that's, I just do this shit when I can. You'd be better off doing a think piece on them. You get more engagement than actually talking to them. Yeah. <laughs> now, that's no diss. I mean, a lot of times it's, it just happens that way. You, you're better off putting out an idea about somebody, a story about somebody oh, yeah. that you are talking to. Them. It's a weird, humble brag for me because of how little I upload and because of my my small amount of subscribers, but the people I've managed to get on. Like, I'm probably the only person on YouTube who's interviewed Ice-T with under 500 subscribers. I Fucking mean, kill that metric. 
I guess, but I also think that you can change that really quickly. Just drop your old clips in the Opus and then start sharing them on uh, <laughs> on shorts. <laughs> Just go do that. <laughs> you oh, don't yeah. have to worry about new content. You've got so much gold in there. Oh yeah, I I dropped a uh, I dropped like a three year old interview clip of uh, Ice T reacting to John Mulaney making fun of him. Eighty thousand views. There you go. Yeah. That's like, yeah, I mean, a lot of this. I didn't know that was allowed. I thought everything needed to be new. No, I, I'm starting to chop up episodes of it's all happening and putting out just different segments. You know, I want to hear that full Andre 3000 interview, Justin. Oh yeah, I still have that. I got that. I got a Drake interview. I got a. I got Chili while he was in jail. Lupe's Mantra interview. I've got a Fantano interview. I got a Charlemagne interview. Oh fuck! I've got a bunch of stuff. I got Charlemagne talking about. 6 9 when all that 6 9 was going on. I got the full interview of the guys that 6 9 beat up at the airport, or they beat up 6 9 at the airport. <laughs> I've never put this stuff out. <laughs> Sitting on a gold mine, Justin. Yeah, a lot of the stuff I was just saving for the book, you know, but, you know, we'll see what's up. I, I, I'm going to start a Patreon. At least I'll have different exclusive. Let things. me know. You, you know, I'm there. Yeah. All right, sir. Right. It has been an absolute pleasure as always. Uh, always, always a fun time talking to you. Hold on, oh, I want to I want to shout out this song that I love, man. I yes. love this song. Who the hardest off of the Dog Pound's new album? We all we got. It is, yeah. It is all, so like, fucking good. That song is amazing. Is that the one with Lady of Rage on it? Yes. Oh my yes. god. <laughs> that, uh, and then what they did with the video was dope too, because it's a, it's a VR video, so you're in the mm -hmm. studio with them. While they're making, while they're everybody's rapping their verses, you look around, you can see everybody. Yo, that is the that is my. I got a playlist. I got three playlists I made this year. Right, I'm not a playlist guy. I like albums, so I like to sync into yeah. process. I got a play three. I made three playlists this year. I made one is called Rap World War Three, so it's all the diss tracks that came out this year that are about. There you go. Topic. I got the I hate Drake EP. That's just Kendrick's. Mm -hmm. And then I got, uh, it's called Kobe Year. And it's all my favorite solo joints this year so far. So the Childish Gambino joint on there. I love that song. Um, Lupe Samurai is on there. Chance the Rappers. Uh, Together, the family joints on there. I'm rooting for Chance. I don't give a fuck what anyone says. Yeah, I, I, I think him and Premier is a good one. And but it's only just like the songs that I really like, 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 like. I got a couple of Kanye joints on there. I got the Kendrick joints on there. I got a couple of Drake joints on there. I had to put who the hardest on. Oh, I got uh, what's my man? Oh, Marv One, Rock Nation. Oh Brunch. shit! That's one of my favorite joints this year, Rock Nation Brunch by Walt Marv One. That song is so fire to me. That beat is so crazy. Um, and I, so I had to add who's the who the hardest because that that joint had me in the chokehold, the Cobra Clutch all weekend. Yeah. I was like, God, Lee, this is crazy. It's so that good. That Dog Pound album is great, too. I love the every few years that Snoop decides to try. Well, he's got Death Row, you know, so yeah. everything. I mean, I've heard so many great things about Snoop's next album. You know, like they're saying his next album, like from people who are very well, who have, you know, Grammy winning ears, you know, that Snoop's album is on a whole nother level. So I like what they're doing over there right now. I'm uh, I'm driving out to Milwaukee a week from Thursday to see him perform. I'm so fucking excited. Yeah, Snoop's guy. He puts on a great show. Oh, yeah. Going to sneak my camera in. Fuck it. <laughs> it's all happening. It's all happening. Look out. Look out for Drake's pop punk album. I, I mean, he's going to look, <laughs> man. Nothing wrong with being in Post Malone territory. He'll be fine. You know, he's stadiums. He's got his hit records, you know. I don't oh, know. Before, we'll see. He looks like he got some softness in the marketplace, though. Let's see what. Before we go, uh, Bernadette says hi, and Sapphire says hi. Oh, my people! That's what's up. That's what's up. All right. That's what's up. Damn it! I damn. talked to them both yesterday. Oh, uh, word. Okay. All right, Justin. Uh, anything you want to plug before we go? Uh, the Company Man YouTube channel. Um, I've got. So today's a month after the battle. I guess it's a month after. Family Matters and Meet the Grams. And so okay. right now I'm about to wrap up this video looking at, I've been I've been covering different angles on this because I'm, I'm working on a book about this. So, you know, I feel like this is a really interesting book, right? Even if it's self-published and just, you know, from a perspective thing. Um, 
we'll see where how it goes. But I'm using a lot of these videos to document different ideas and thoughts that I have around it. And so right now, the article, I'm, I mean, the article, but the video I'm doing is on that odd segue with game versus Rick Ross. Because oh, yeah. I, I think game really wants to diss Kendrick. And there's a few things, reasons why, right? Uh, so I'm going to lay all those out in the video. And then I've been experimenting with reaction tracks again. So I'm going to react. Okay. Later today, I'm going to react to Not Like Us, which I've never done, like a full reaction video to it. But I'm going to react to the Taylor Swift version. Because they ran Not Like Us and Euphoria through AI. <laughs> Damn, <laughs> okay. Taylor Swift voice. And it's so, so many words from Taylor Swift's mouth. Oh my God. On Euphoria, when she says, I don't even like the way you say nigga. That's just me, I guess. That's just so funny. <laughs> I heard the one with Peter Griffin from Family Guy rapping it. Oh, I missed it. Oh my God. It's so good. <laughs> oh, so this is, I mean, I, I look at all this as oh, a super fun time in music. So, you know. that's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, and I I did see an over under on you know going around on Twitter being like during the beef like how long is it going to be before Game tries to insert himself into this? Man, he did it early. Oh, he posted right. he posted Drake lyrics before Kendrick even responded. Oh uh, shit! So, okay, I didn't know that. You know, I mean, Game is Game is Game. I love Game's yeah. music. I think he's one of the best rappers I've ever heard in my life. And I, oh, mean, I, I think it's, I I think it's a great music so much. I just pretend that he doesn't do interviews. That's I have to compartmentalize. <laughs> you should talk to Gabe. You should reach out to Gabe for an interview. Oh, yeah. That, no, I would just I would have too much fun dating him. I don't know. Oh, gosh. Okay. Well, we'd see how it goes. Or I'd he's accidentally inside, pick he, him off. Then I'd be in, in Professor Sky territory with him. He's, so, an, he's an insightful guy. You know what I mean? I think every time I've talked to Gabe, I always feel like I received more than I offered, you know, and I don't always feel that way when I interact with people, huh. you know, I think that, uh, but yeah, you know, he, he's been in the industry so long, he's had to be on defense so long that it's hard to tell what's real and what's not. So, you know, maybe if you baited him, it could be, could, be could, get, could, could you get him, could get you the monetization, you know, you'd be, Just you're already, you already all the way into the bus if it doesn't work out. Uh, you're, you're already halfway there. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Right. All right, my friend. Thank you so much. Much love to you. Likewise. Check out I the Company you. Man channel. Check out the I'm Dan Carlin channel. Fucking A right. My brother. It's all happening.